all for you guys then. Hi. So I am going to talk about anti-fragility. And um, I start by introducing myself a little bit. So I currently work as a test consultant, fairly humble title, at a consultancy with Infinity Works in Leeds. I have worked for some lesser or more known companies before. So I started my QA role at Linden Lab. I don't know if anybody remembers Second Life, which was a virtual world that was going to change the internet in the early 2000s. But anyways, you have certainly have heard of Disney Online, I assume. And our plan does um, connected planning, basically planning in the cloud. And a couple of other smaller companies nobody's ever heard of. So I'm originally from Duisburg in Germany. I then moved to Brighton, that was for Linden Lab because they had just opened an office there. And then I moved to Gibraltar for a few years. And after that, I moved back to the UK, <laughs> um, where I'm currently living. And I'm living in York, which is in the north of England. I have worked as a chef and a bartender and uh, um, theater as an assist, I call it as assistant director. I was the closest to the director in a kind of off-Broadway thick kind of so it's, um, production. Mainly that makes me the dog's body for everything, but you know. I really liked it. However, at some point I realized that my life needed a little bit more constancy and slightly more predictable work hours than I had with these jobs. And so I became a QA engineer. And um, my interests include philosophy, which this is mostly about, literature and textile arts. So I do a lot of knitting and spinning and sewing and that kind of thing. So as I mentioned, I live in York, but I work in Leeds, which means I have a commute of roughly 90 minutes door to door. I read a lot, so for me that is fine. This gives me the opportunity to read because otherwise it's really hard to fit dedicated reading time into a life, which I'm sure you guys know. It also helps me clear the waiting time while I'm waiting for the train or the next train or any train that's going roughly in the right direction. The UK train system is not really known for its reliability. And that is kind of how this talk started. I was reading a book by a guy called Nassim Nicholas Talab. The, call, the book is called Anti-Fragility. And I really liked the theories he presented, so they kind of kept going around in my head. And um, eventually, it coincided with a quarterly mini-conference we do in our company. So I thought, OK, so just to you know clear my head of these theories, I will put turn this into a lightning talk, I will present this at the mini-conf and see what other people think about this and see if they think this is useful. And um, it was quite well received. In fact, it was then invited over to one of our clients for an International Women's Day event. And I thought, okay, maybe there is something more in this. So I put together a full-time version, or a full-length version of this and sent it out to conferences and hey, here I am. So this is all going to get a little bit meta. Like I say, this is founded in a philosophical treatment. So I don't say you haven't been warned. And you may have heard about the author. He actually got quite a lot of attention for the book called The Black Swan, which he published just before the big stock market crash. And he basically predicted the stock market crash in this book. And this, so his whole body of work deals with uncertainty and the unpredictability of crisis and how you deal with that. He used to be a stock trader before that, so he knows, knows a little bit about the ups and downs and predictability. So being a tester, obviously this kind of got my attention because what we, that's what we do, right? We try to prevent this big negative event from happening or at least put ourselves in a position where if it happens, we can deal with it in a reasonable way. And to do that, we come up with test strategies. Any successful test strategy needs to be founded in reality. It cannot, so 
and because we are bound to constraints for this test strategy. Like, we have limited time, we have limited resources, we may have limited knowledge or limited information. So all of this means this are constraints and we need to know what we're planning with. We need to know that we're planning with the reality of these constraints and not wishful thinking or scaremongering or knee-jerk reactions to perceived threats, right? Panicky, not good. So what is anti-fragility? And how can it help us with the whole testing thing? Taleb proposes that there are basically three different states. If I ask you for the opposite of robust, many people would say fragile, breakable, you know, any of these things. What he says is, however, there's this third state, which is anti-fragile, which is not just robust or just fragile. It means you can emerge from a crisis in an improved state. You come out of it better than you were before. So if you think of it this way, Greek mythology, Damocles. Damocles was a guy who was super jealous of his king. He kind of thought, I should be king. So he nagged and nagged and nagged his king, Dionysus, and Dionysus, until Dionysus offered him to swap places for one day. He said, okay, for one day, you will be king. So the king points up and says, and now look up. And you see this big sword that is hanging just above your head, pointing at you, held up only by one hair from a horse's tail. This is a fairly fragile position. So Damocles was not impressed by this and didn't even make it through the net before. He said, okay, this pressure is too much for me. I don't want to die here, right? I just want to be king. So he resigned and they resumed business as normal. So now if you look at the phoenix, another mythical creature. It's a bird that is reborn from fire when it dies. So it dies, it's reborn in fire, it grows old again, it dies again, reborn from fire. The phoenix doesn't care for crisis. It doesn't care if it dies because it will come back at exactly the same state as it was before. So it is not any better, but it's also not harmed. This is what we call, call robust. It just doesn't care for crisis. <coughs> and then the hydra, yet another mythical beast. The hydra is a dragon that is not indestructible, but it is very, very hard to kill. Every time you cut off one of its head, two new ones grow back. This is what we mean when we talk about anti-fragility. You basically inflict a critical negative event on this thing, but it grows two new heads. It is now better than it was before. It's more dangerous. <clears throat> or a real day or an end life application, my train situation. Now, you probably are not really familiar <laughs> with the um, railway system in the UK, so let me give you a little bit of background. This is not a joke. This is reality. The train system was privatized a couple of decades ago, and ever since, not a lot of money is being reinvested into the train system. So the whole thing is now in a rather sorry state. They run with the old trains as long as they possibly can, and trains are constantly delayed. They are overcrowded. They are never on time. They, honestly, nightmare. So obviously, because I depend on these trains, this put, puts me in a really fragile position because if I don't show up for work, obviously my employers are not particularly happy with me. And sooner or later, I will get into trouble. Now, fragile position, my train situation in software development, we call this a dependency. We depend on a system that is outside of our control. We depend on another team that is outside of our control. We depend on something that we cannot control, but that is essential for our success. 
So modern teams try to steer away from this by building full stack teams, where we try to have very varied knowledge within the same team that allows us to tackle all, all the necessities of getting a product from inception to production within the team. So we have front end, back end, DevOps, and so on and so forth. But risk assessment work in a way that we only ever prepare for things we already know. The biggest risk we prepare for is only the biggest risk we know about, we have encountered before. Failure can take many shapes, and it may take a shape that we are not familiar with yet, that is in the unknown at this point. Because unexpected events, by their very nature, take unexpected forms. For example, the nuclear reactor in Fukushima, everybody remembers that big fallout system. It withstood the earthquake pretty well. It was built to deal with earthquakes because Japan has a lot of earthquakes. So earthquake happened, the backup generators kicked in just as planned. What it didn't do well was deal with the tsunami that followed because that was unplanned and unforeseen. So what nuclear uh, scientists in Japan do these days is not try to build more tsunami-proof reactors. They are investigating whether they can build very small nuclear reactors that can be buried deep into the ground. So should a negative or a critical meltdown event ever happen, it is far removed from everything that could potentially be damaged by it. So that's another way to look at you know, dealing with that risk. Oops. Sorry. Or a more testing focused um, story. We implemented a load testing framework. We use Gatling. Fairly, you know, uh, everybody uses Gatling these days. Personally, I'm not a fan, to be perfectly honest, partly because of what I'm going to tell you next. So, um, we, we had a tester, this was on a, um, in a client project. We had a test engineer from the, test, uh, from the client team. He basically implemented this all on his own. We ran the first rounds of tests against the API we had been developing, and they were catastrophic. The test results indicated that our API wouldn't even be able to support a single user. So now we were quite concerned, A, but also slightly confused because, you know, I had been testing this whole thing and I did some very light load testing with other tools. And I said, I hadn't noticed any great performance issues. How is this even possible? So upon closer inspection, it turned out that the implementation of the test framework wasn't great. Or to quote one of my developers, running code is not the same thing as testing. So what this testing framework or the, the, this specific implementation he did, did was it was creating a huge amount of load in a completely unrealistic pattern against a very low spec test environment. I was built such that it depended on certain steps being executed in certain order. All of that was randomized, so we had a huge amount of failures. All of this because, simply because it wasn't implemented in a way that actually looked at what we're trying to test and what we're trying to determine and asked a question that we were trying to answer with those tests. It was just you know, random load. So what did we learn from this? Two things. A, it is really easy to bring an API down. Throw enough chaotic load at it and it will just fall over. Right? Not very useful learning. We all knew this before. The other more important insight was that if you do this, think about what you're doing. Define the problem you're trying to solve. So in the end, we switched to a different load testing framework. We swapped Gatling for Locust. Locust is a Python library that is very, very easy to implement. It took us half a day to get a very basic test suite running. It is very focused on simulating use cases. So that's what you do. And um, it allows for very intuitive um, load shaping. So on the other hand, it may be that 
your preconceived theory is exactly the thing that stops you from learning what you need to do. If you go to a problem and you try to analyze your problem, but you already know, think you know what the outcome is, you're probably not do, going to do a very good job at analyze, analyzing it, right? Especially if you're dealing with complex systems. Predicting what is going on in a complex system is a gamble at best. So if, speaking in a mathematical sense, a complicated system is just a system that's very large. It's hard to understand. It may be many, many moving parts, but it is essentially understandable. A complex system, on the other hand, is not. A complex system is a system that has emergent behavior and emergent properties. So you can not really predict how, that, how that's going to react. And for systems of such complexity, maybe having a preconceived theory is not the best approach. Maybe what you want to do is observe and form your theories following things that happen with, say, some regularity. You see blips in your monitoring, and you investigate those. Which is obviously exactly what is happening in the observability space these days. That's what you do, right? You build your system in a way that makes it easy for you to monitor events and to follow events through. The idea being that a sufficiently complex system is never fully healthy and never fully stable. You always will have some things, and they may interact in very unforeseen ways. A teensy little change may cascade to your system and come out at the end as a big failure. You don't know. You just need to be able to follow the track basically. This needs to be considered early on in the development cycle, obviously. So you need to build your systems in such a way that you can plug in your monitoring and that you can extend your or switch on and off logging. You don't want to log all the time every single event, but you want to be able to if the need arises. So things that are more complicated are not necessarily better. We have to make conscious decisions about what we're trying to achieve. It may mean that we need to invest a little bit more thinking and a little bit more work into architecting our systems. But we want to build systems that are understandable, that are maybe complicated. Sometimes this is not possible. If we have complex systems, then we will need to build systems that, where you can easy, easily understand how to get your information out of this. So in our consultancy work, we focus a lot on building systems, A, with the client, so that they understand how we architect these things, but also to build them in such a way that they're maintainable for the client, that they're maintainable without having needing to have you know, 10 years of arcane knowledge of how every little piece in this has come to be. You should ideally be able to look at the system and look at the code and know what it's doing. Simple is not the same as easy, but simple is important. So, and we have learned this lesson in software development. I'm not sure that we have learned this lesson for our test strategies all the time. You often hear that people, you know, respond to testing problems with throwing more bodies at the problem, throwing more scripts at the problem. More load at the system under test. This is not necessarily what solves the problem. Just as we do with developing features, we need to ask why we're doing what we're doing. We need to understand what problem it is we're trying to solve. What question are we trying to answer? Different stages of, de of development often require different test strategies. Quite often, you cannot just do you know, the same thing throughout the entire life cycle of your project. We have a tendency to fix problems that we have encountered before without actually knowing that they will be a problem again.
And I think following lean principles in development can help to avoid this fantasy, fix something when it actually becomes a problem. You know, we observe something that might become a problem and we rush in and want to prevent it from actually becoming a problem, from causing an error. So you go fix it. And I'm the first one to admit that I do this, right? You have seen this before, you find like, oh no, I know this, well. this is going to fall over. Don't do that. If our system is well architected, it should have some self-healing properties and we should allow the system to do that, to fix itself before we go in and fix it. Networking and TCP, for example, are systems that, have, that are built to deal with uncertain conditions. You throw information in one end, you expect it to come out the other end. You are not necessarily able to you know, predict which, which route it does and take, it takes in between. So the system is able of rerouting messages if it has to. Cloud services can be set up the same way. You can you specify the rules and the cloud and the server uh, or your infrastructure in the cloud responds dynamically, spinning up servers, taking the EBs down, rerouting traffic, that kind of thing. So. However, what is a system if not the sum of all its parts? Maybe more. How do we support teams in this search for anti-fragility? How do we work with human nature and not against it? Cognitive biases are everybody's darling these days. Right? You hear it everywhere. And I think with good reason, it behooves us well to distrust this machine in our head, to question and be critical of our gut reactions and our reflexive responses. Evolution has not prepared us well to live in the world we live in right now. Our cognitive systems are stuck way back in the past. One thing, however, has remained a constant throughout human evolution. And that is storytelling. We unite over stories. If you like or if you're interested in certainty and its effect on complex systems, I would definitely recommend giving this book a read. And I think that a lot of the book really deals with one common theme is decentralize. Do not have one central point of failure decentralize as much as you can, empower your people to act in unison with your story, but as indi individual components. <coughs> and my train problem, well, these days I'm taking the bus, I'm no longer on the train, my bus is on time, I, it is spacious, I have a seat, I can read my book in pleasure, eh, in comfort. And if my bus ever doesn't come, I have a fallback to my reliably horrible train service. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs>